All right, good morning, Port City. How you guys doing? Good. Well, it is awesome to be here with you for the Summer Sabbath series where we are learning to rest in God and to enjoy his good gifts, a season of worship and wonder, worshiping who God is and just being in wonder of the amazing things, relationships, simple things of everyday life that he has given us and blessed us with. And I want to let you know a little bit of my story. So I got to know Jesus back in college. I was at University of Oregon, the Go Ducks, quack, quack, right? And yes, there's somebody there. Uh, so anyways, I am a freshman. I'm new at college and I'm like, God, I'm gonna give this thing a shot. I'm gonna try and follow you. And so I go to a campus group and I'm like, hey, how do I do this? How do I follow God? And they're like, well, hey, you do music. Why don't you come and lead worship at our weekly gathering? And I'm like, well, I don't know that I'm a Christian yet, but okay, you know, so, so I go and I'm leading worship at this gathering and I'm like, okay, but I still feel a bit empty. What's next? Like, oh, well, are you studying your Bible? We got this Thursday night Bible study. And I'm like, all right, I'll go do that. So I go to that, and it's good, and we're learning about the Bible, and learning about God, but I still feel empty. So I'm like, well, now what? Like, well, are you praying? Another group said, hey, we have this 6 a.m. prayer gathering. I heard that. I was like, oh, that sounds like Navy SEALs. Gung-ho for Jesus, right? So I'm gonna do that. That'll show God I'm really serious. So I'm getting up at 6 a.m. and my roommates are all hung over and they're like, dude, where are you going? I'm like, I'm gonna go pray, you know? And so I go and I pray, but I still felt empty. Like, well, well, now what? And they're like, well, are you sharing your faith? And they gave me a stack of tracks and I'm like, how do I do that? And they unleashed me like a unsuspecting wolf on, a uh, wolf on all my victims, you know? I, I, don't, I barely know anything about the faith and I'm trying to talk about God. Anyways, I find myself in this catch-22 where it seemed like the more stuff that I was doing for God, the more distant God seemed. And the irony was that I had suddenly all this applause of people who were going, oh my gosh, look at Josh, he's on fire for Jesus. And I'm like, well, I don't want to let my new friends down. And so I would just kind of pretend that everything was all right. And on the outside, I kept going through the motions, but on the inside, I was like, God, I don't know if this is working. Well, that year progressed, and finally I was like, well, I know what'll fix it. I'll go on a mission trip. Because in my mind, God is just waiting to make sure I'm all in, that I'm really serious about this. And that's like the sign you're all in, right? You go overseas on a mission trip, whatever, right? So I go to Japan, and it was this amazing trip, and the church there was amazing. And the church, the Japanese church, they just seemed to rest in the love of God for them, to rest. It's not like they weren't doing stuff. I mean, that's going on. But it wasn't characterized by the same striving that I had in my own life. And I thought, man, that is beautiful, but I don't know how to make sense of that. So I came back home, and this is sort of the, the climax. The main point of the story is I had this landscaping job for three days in this backyard all by myself. So it's August, I'm hot, I'm sweaty, I'm pulling up all these deep roots and bushes and flowers, or whatever. And I get to the end of this three days, and in retrospect, it actually seemed kind of symbolic, right? Because I'm simultaneously, I'm wrestling, pulling up all these deep roots in my soul. Like, God, I don't know if I buy this, I don't know if I believe in you, I'm trying it and it's not working. And I get to the end of this three days, I'm surrounded by all this uprooted dust and dirt and death. And I remember finally, I just shouted out, top of my lungs in that backyard, just, Forget it, God, forget it. I think I threw a lot of expletives and stuff there too. <laughs> forget it. Like, God, I have tried this thing. I went all out after you. I did everything I thought to do, everything they said to do, whatever, and you haven't shown up. You aren't here. Forget it. I'm done. And I was done. It wasn't like I changed my mind the next day. I tried it. It didn't work. I'm done. I don't know if it was a minute later or an hour later, but all I know is I, I found myself surrounded by the presence of Jesus. Like the presence of the risen Christ. And this is like at the very moment when I just kind of flipped him the bird, said, hey, I'm done. I don't want anything to do with you. And I found myself like being in the throne room with the king. And what I heard him say was, Josh, you've had this whole thing backwards. You thought this was about you coming out to find me. And the whole time, I've been the one coming out to find you. I've been the one coming out to find you. Suddenly, my whole paradigm for who God is, the gospel, Christianity, got flipped upside down on its head. I was going, man, this isn't about me going out to find God. This is God coming out to find me. 
These verses started coming to life like Ephesians 2.8 where Paul says, it is by grace through faith that you have been saved. And I realized, man, I had that backwards. I thought it was by faith through grace. Like, God, I bring you my faith and I, I do all the stuff and I perform and I show you that I'm serious. And that creates this channel where you're like, okay, now I can give you some grace. You're going, no, that's backwards. It starts with God and his gracious goodness. And faith is just getting our eyes off ourselves to receive the goodness of God that has come for us in Christ. Gospel is not about you going out to find God. It's about God coming to find you. I want to talk with you this morning about the pursuing God and how we can find rest in the pursuing God. We're going to be in Luke 15 this morning. So if you have your Bible, you want to turn there to Luke chapter 15. Uh, but we're going to see today that Jesus is going to give us this picture of how we can find rest in the pursuing God. Uh, because I think a lot of us, if we're honest, we often tend to treat God like he's lost, like he's gone missing. He's gone hiding, happily in hide and seek out in the universe somewhere. He's behind the cosmic couch and we got to go out into the universe and look for God. We gotta, so we talk about things like searching for God and exploring spirituality and finding faith. But what if we have it backwards and God's actually the one coming after us? What if your job is not so much to find the light switch and turn on the lights as it is to step out of the shadows? Not to earn God's love, but to receive it. The title for the message this morning is The Pursuing God. Let's jump in in Luke chapter 15. Now, in context here, Jesus is being critiqued for his crew. He's hanging out with the rascals and the ragamuffins, like the crowd he's not supposed to be with, the tax collectors and sinners. And so he's getting critiqued. In verse 2, they say, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so let's pick up in verse 3 where Jesus responds. It says, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Stop there for a moment. Jesus says that God is like a reckless shepherd. God is like a reckless shepherd. He shares this story in response to their critique of who he's going after and hanging out with. And he shares this story and he says, man, you know, there's this shepherd, we'll call him Billy. And so Billy's out in the field. He's got his 100 sheep. And one day Billy recognizes, hey, one of them's gone missing. And so Billy leaves the 99 to go out and find this one. And, and Jesus asks the obvious follow-up question, like, wouldn't you? And of course, you and I, 21st century Westerners with our total lack of any sheep herding experience, we nod our heads up and down. We're like, yes, you love that sheep. Like you, you care so much for that little lamb lid. Of course you go out. Silly Westerners, right? Like reality is if he leaves the 99, he's leaving the 99 open to wolves and bear attacks and thieves. He could be coming home with 99 problems and a sheep just one, right? And so... I imagine know-it-all Joe in the back kind of raises his hand. He's like, yo, Jesus, no. Like, you cut your losses, stick with the safe bet. You stick with the 99. It's good math. But Jesus says God missed economics 101. And Billy, he goes out after that one lost sheep. Jesus is saying that God is like a reckless shepherd. It looks reckless in the time. Like, that's bad economics. Oh, you stick with the 99. Jesus, God, Jesus is going, no, God, it looks reckless to the eyes of the watching world, but God is going out after the people that you would not expect. And here's the point I want to draw your attention to. This is not a story about the sheep going out to find the shepherd. This is a story about the shepherd going out to find the sheep. Jesus is not giving instructions on how you and I can go find God. He is declaring that in the light of the gospel and his kingdom, God is the one coming to find you. And this confronts how I think we tend to use the word lost today, right? Like uh, the word lost has fallen on hard times. It can sound arrogant and condescending as if you and I and the church, whatever, like, we're the ones who have it all together, and the lost are those who need to get their act together. As if you and I are the ones who have all the answers, and they, the lost, have only questions. As if we are like this oasis of perfection, and the lost are those who need to pick up their luggage and come journey to find us and get to this place so that they can drink of our wonderful waters. As if, right? 
Like the reality is, lost here, Jesus is using it in the opposite way. Jesus inverts the direction of movement. And here he's saying that it's, lost doesn't mean you need to go find God. Lost means that God is coming to find you. Lost for Jesus here, it doesn't mean idiot, fool, or outsider. Lost means loved. Now, you don't believe me? Well, check this out. Jesus kind of keeps going. He tells three lost stories in a row in Luke 15. And uh, a lost coin, a lost, a lost sheep, lost coin, and a lost son. And in every story, the emphasis is on the searcher. It's on the heart of the one who's going after and cares extravagantly for what was lost. So in the next story, uh, the story of a coin, and so there's this woman, and she's got these 10 coins, and she loses one of her coins, and, and so she, Jesus says she lights the lamp, and she's up all night, looking under the couch cushions, turning over the cupboards, got, got to find that one missing coin. And again, Jesus asks the obvious question, well, wouldn't you? I'm not so sure. I like my sleep, right? Like, I got nine other perfectly good coins, and man, if I stay up all night looking for that, that one, I could be really tired in the morning, and I'm gonna sleep in, hit my alarm one too many times, be late for work, lose my job where I earn my coins. And so I think I'll just stick with my nine coins and get a good night's rest. But Jesus, again, is saying God slept through math class. What Jesus is saying here is your creator is not an accountant calmly counting the cost. That God is not a level-headed lady demurely discerning the decision. No, your maker is Crazy Annie tearing up the couch cushions, pulling apart the cupboards, looking up all night, just tearing the house apart, trying to find that one missing Rosabelle. God is a frantic woman in search of lost change, Jesus is saying, right? And that lost change is you and I. God is the pursuing God who is out to find you. This means that God is committed to you. God is coming after you in his gospel. God has gone all the way to hell and back on the cross to be with you forever. That is how serious God is about you. I don't know where you're at this morning. You might be at a spot this morning where you feel lost right now. Like you feel like, man, if... You knew just the, the mistakes I've made or the things I've done. Where, where you're at, you're just going, man, I, I just feel too distant from God. Like I tried and I did the work, I did the effort. I just, I feel isolated and alone. I believe what Jesus wants you to know this morning is that God is coming after you. If there are areas in your life where you feel lost, where you feel isolated, where you feel like you don't have it all together. Jesus is going, those are the very areas that the pursuing God, the God of the gospel, wants to come and encounter you and to meet you in those places. Jesus says here, in essence, you can rest in the pursuing God. That it's never been about you going out to find him. It's been about him coming to find you. That you and I, in this story, we're the sheep, right? You're the sheep stuck in the crags, lost in the ravine, and God is the reckless shepherd coming to get you. You and I, you're the coin kind of under the couch cushion, the musty smell in the shadows. But can you hear the ruckus? Couch just got flung over. Doors just flung open. The whole living room's getting torn apart. It's the hound of heaven coming to find you. God is like a bull in a china shop, and he is willing to crash through your circumstances and to crush down your idols in order to get to your heart. It may look reckless to the watching world, but God is coming to find you. And when he finds you, how does he respond? Let's keep going. In verse five, Jesus says, and when he, when Billy the shepherd, right, when he finds it, his missing sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Joyfully. God embraces us with surprising joy. God embraces you and I with surprising joy. Jesus says that Billy finds that sheep, he greets it 
joyfully, and that's not what I would expect. I would have expected like a stern lecture. Like, why can't you be like your 99 responsible older brothers and sisters, right? Like, where have you been? Do you know how crazy how I've been searching for you? But Jesus says, no, there's no finger wagging. There's no, I told you so. There's no, if you ever again. Rather, God encounters us in Christ and he greets us with joy. Not only that, I love how Billy puts the sheep over his shoulders, Jesus says, to carry the sheep home. When God finds you, he doesn't give you a road map with directions going, okay, take a, take a left up there and then a right. There's the GPS coordinates now. I'll meet you when you get there. You can get there yourself. No, when God finds you in your distance, he delights to put you over his shoulders and to carry you there himself. That God finds joy not only to save you, but to sanctify you, to do the work of making you holy, of preparing you and bringing you and making you ready for his kingdom. God embraces us with surprising joy. And when I think about that, I think of Jim and Sarah. Uh, so we were a part, uh, we, we've been a part of a foster care and adoptive movement. Uh, we're adoptive parents, my wife and I, and I got three kids at home. It's Father's Day. I got a 12-year-old, eight and seven-year-old. They're amazing. They're the best. Uh, but Jim and Sarah were <coughs> foster parents, and they welcomed into their home years ago, Misha. Misha was a teenager, and she had a tragic Backstory, right? Like she uh, had been homeless on the streets, had been trafficked into the sex trade, and so had been exploited and abused by, uh, by men and had just a lot of gnarly history for anyone, especially for one so young as a teenager. And so she was in the foster care system, and when Jim and Sarah welcomed her into their home, uh, the first week was kind of the honeymoon phase, right, where Everything was so sweet. We're so glad you're here. And oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. And everything was great. And after about a week or two, though, the honeymoon ended. And suddenly, Misha, I mean, she was like constantly shouting and screaming and breaking things and throwing things and calling Jim and Sarah all sorts of names. And, you know, and actually with Jim, it was interesting because she would kind of like flirt with him because she'd learned, hey, that's how you get protection. That's how you get provision. That's how, with men. And so Jim, when you know, buy into it, he, he wouldn't respond to it, but still there was this dynamic where she was doing that and it was just hard for Sarah to watch even though Jim wasn't responding to it. And <clears throat> Sarah, on the other hand, like, man, Mish would just call her a string of names and mom wasn't one of them, right? And so they go through about six months of this, just the turbulence of this whole thing. And after about six months, they're like, hey, we need a date night. So they get a babysitter, they go out on the town, they dress the nines, they go out to a fancy dinner and they get time to just reconnect and just their marriage and it's good. They have a beautiful night together and they feel rested and they feel refreshed and they come home to their home and they come in the door and the babysitter's like, hey, things went great. Misha was so good. She's now sleeping upstairs. They're like, awesome. And so they go upstairs and they start to get ready for bed. And as they're getting ready for bed, Jim walks into the bathroom and he says, oh no, Sarah, don't come in here. Sarah's ears perk up like, like what, what, what's going on in there? And so she, she goes to the bathroom and she tries to get in and Jim like, like tries shutting the door, but she gets her foot in and so Sarah's kind of pushing and Jim's like, no, don't come in here. And Sarah's like, I want to see what's going on. And so eventually she, she pushes the door open and she comes inside. And what she discovers is that Misha, while they were away, Misha had taken her red lipstick and had drawn in big scrawling letters all over the bathroom walls F you, mom, F you, mom, F you, mom. Pardon my French, I just want to be honest with what I was saying. Like, Misha was just letting out her rage all over this bathroom wall. And Jim immediately is like, man, he's thinking we shouldn't have gone out. Like, this was too hard for Misha. What's this going to do to Sarah? And man, this is so hard. This is not what I expected. I wish I, wish I could have gotten that door closed quick enough to clean up the mirror and clean up the bathroom walls before Sarah got in here. But it's a shock and to his surprise, he turns and he sees that Sarah is beginning to laugh. Like not like a little chuckle, but like, like it begins as this, this laugh and it begins to build and it's coming deep from within. And before she knows it, she's crying. And before Jim knows it, he looks and she's falling over. She's curled on the ground laughing and crying. 
And Jim starts to think like, oh my gosh, she's lost it. You know, like, we really shouldn't have gone out. What were we thinking? Like, yeah, this was just too much. And I went over, oh man, this, this, what, what have we done? And finally, he, you know, he's so shocked, but he finally gets it out. He's like, Sarah, what is so funny? And through her laughter and her tears, Sarah says, she called me mom. She called me mom. It was the first time that Sarah, that Misha had called her mom. I don't know about you, but I love how God loves our angry prayers. You see, I think that often you and I can be like Jim, that we think that, man, God is not gonna be able to handle what he's gonna see in the bathroom walls of our heart. And so before he gets in, we gotta get out the Clorox and the Windex and we gotta scrub everything down and polish things up and make it look nice and pretty. And maybe sometimes if we get a little courage, we'll leave a little post-it note on the, uh, the mirror. It says, sorry, Dad, had a little bit of a bad day, right? But the reality is that you and I are much more like Misha been beat up and wounded by the world. We've got difficult things that have gone on and, and we've got like, man, the, the emotions and the, the craziness, the, the things that wanna come out. And the beauty of the gospel is that God is like Sarah. That God is big enough to handle the, the stuff that's scrawled on the bathroom walls of your heart and he is able to, to take it and so he's able to take it and step in and bring it but he delights to hear us call him Father. That when we bring God honestly where we are at, I believe God curls over in a heap of laughter and tears and he's the pursuing God who goes, man, he called me Dad. She called me Dad. You see, when you, you get the gospel of the pursuing God, the God who's coming after you, it reframes what prayer is, that prayer the goal of prayer is not to be good so much as it is to be honest. Right? Friend Kyle Strobel has told that to me. He says, hey, the, the primary goal, we misunderstand prayer. We think the primary goal of prayer is often we think it's a place to be good. This is where I'm gonna go perform and I'm gonna do this thing for God. I'm gonna say all the right words and whatever. But really prayer is more an invitation. It's a space to be honest, to come before your creator and your maker and bring him where you're truly at. I love this about the Psalms, how the psalmists are constantly just, where are you, God, and what is going on? And my life feels like a mess, but they're able to bring it before God. And I love it. My, my friend Jake, he prays these prayers at times where uh, we'll pray together, and he, he's like, God, he'll say things like that. And I'm, at first, like, I'm thinking, man, is that okay to say that? <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, you sound like the Psalms. Like, the Psalms, you are able to bring God. God invites you to bring honesty with where you're at. Now it's true that over time we grow in holiness. Like if 10 years later, Misha's still saying, F you mom, whatever, there's a, there's a problem. But it starts with coming before God as we're really at. And over time, that experience of intimacy with the Father it begins to transform you from the inside out. God is inviting you to be honest in your prayer life, to go, God, this is how I really feel. This is where I'm really at. You know, I used to feel guilty. One of the ways I pray, I, I've never been able to like just kind of fold my hands and concentrate. My mind's going a million places. So I, I, I tend to pray walking. I go on a walk most nights and I'll walk the neighborhood for about 45 minutes. And part of that time I'll spend just bringing my heart before God. And I used to find, man, wandering thoughts a challenge, where I'd be out walking and I'd be trying to pray about something, but my thoughts would go somewhere else. Uh, but then well, there's a whole tradition called wandering prayer, where, well, hey, if my mind's going to that thing, that's probably a sign that that's where my heart is at, and so why don't I just go and pray about that thing now? <laughs> and so praying, the beauty of going, the pursuing God means you can bring God your wandering thoughts. You can bring God your depths and concerns. You can bring God whatever you've got going on in the bathroom walls of your heart. And I believe your heavenly father simply delights you would call him dad. But there's more. God doesn't just greet you with joy and carry you on his shoulders to bring you home. There's something more that Jesus says here. In verse six, 
when he gets home. He says, then this shepherd, Billy, he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus says here that God throws the biggest block party the town's ever seen when one of his kids comes home. God throws this huge block party. So Jesus says, hey, Billy, he gets home, and then he calls his friends and his neighbors, like, come over and rejoice with me. And the question I have is, who throws a party for their pet? Right? Like, back when my wife and I were first dating, she had this cat named Iggy, and Holly loved that cat. I'm not a pet person, so sorry, but she did. And one day, that clumsy little thing fell out of the window right, and got lost. So Iggy was up in the second story in this bathroom and fell into the bushes and ran away. And so Holly called me, and she's like, hey, Iggy ran away. I need your help. And so I'm like, ah, she'll be all right, you know? But I was like, no, really? And I'm like, all right, all right. So I cancel all my afternoon meetings. I come over, and I'm like, we're scouring the neighborhood. We're looking under cars and looking under bushes, looking all everywhere. And finally, after a few hours, we found Iggy. And I was stoked, but I was like, let's watch Netflix and get takeout happy, right? I was not like, let's spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars and call all the neighborhood and bring them together to celebrate. I got my pet back, you know? And yet, Jesus is saying here that God celebrates people you wouldn't expect. And he celebrates them more extravagantly than you would expect. And I don't know where you're at, but you may not feel very polished and pretty and put together. Maybe you're like part of that rascal and ragamuffin crew that Jesus was hanging out with. But Jesus says, hey, the pursuing God, he not only encounters you with joy, but he celebrates you. He brings you home to celebrate you and to be with you. These three lost stories, they escalate in Luke 15. So the first one is one coin out of 100. That's 1%. Right? Next one goes to one coin out of 10. That's 10%. Last one goes to one son out of two, 50%. And not only the percentage, but the, the object of value increases from a sheep some change, money, to a child. And I believe God, I believe Jesus here, he's raising the stakes. He's up in the ante going, man, if your God will do that for that missing lamblet, right? If your God will throw that kind of party for that lost change, how do you think he's gonna respond when he finds you and brings you home? God has called you, has pursued you, has chased you down to love you, to celebrate you, to be in life with you, together with you. The goal is union with Christ, life with the presence of God. And that means you can rest in the pursuing God. As we're in this summer Sabbath season, you are invited to rest because it's rooted not just in what God does, but in who God is. You see, when you think it's about your pursuit of God and you've got to, man, perform and find meaning and chase down transcendence and go after all these things, you get tired. Where are you out over time? But when it's about the pursuing God, his pursuit of you, you can rest in that. You can find peace in that. And I wonder this morning, how do you think God sees you? Do you believe that God is inviting you into intimacy with him. Do you believe that God wants to celebrate you and do life with you? So there is rest when we do that. I want to <clears throat> invite us into a time of prayer here in a moment. And I like to do listening prayer. And uh, sometimes my wife and I will do this. And what we'll do, we're kind of this two-step process I'll guide you through, but process one is to, to bring before God and listen, God, is there a lie right now that the enemy is whispering to me? Is there a fear I'm living under? Something that's not really of you. Then for the second part and the truth, we'll ask, hey, but Jesus, what is the truth that you have to speak into me? What is your gospel, your scriptures, your word, anything that you would have to say through your spirit to me right here now as your, as your follower? And to give you an example of this that relates to this passage, I about a month or so ago, um, I woke up one morning and I had this just burning thought in my head, this thing that was running through, and it was, uh, you're gonna die now. 
And I was like, what? <laughs> what, what? What's going on there? Where'd that come from? I got to freak out. So, so I woke up. And so I, I, went, I went for a walk and I did, I did this prayer. I said, hey, God, what's the lie that I'm, is there a lie I'm believing? The enemy's speaking a fear I'm under. And I felt the spirit of God reveal to me, you know, this backdrop. I've been working on the, this next book and it's been a lot of work and a couple year process and now it's just wrapping up. And the lie the Spirit of God was revealing was, you, you think that God just wants to use you to get that project done. And then when it's done, he's done with you. You're gonna die now because he doesn't need you anymore. That project's done. And then I brought before God, okay, God, the gospel, the pursuing God, Jesus, what, what do you have to say? What's your truth? And what I said the Spirit of God speaking was, Josh, before I ever called you to use you, I called you to love you. Like, I didn't call you first and foremost to get stuff done. I called you to love you, to be with you and celebrate you. And that is your heavenly father's invitation for you as children of God. He is inviting you this morning, this Father's Day, your heavenly father is inviting you as his children to find yourself in his affection and his care and his embrace to him celebrate over you. And so I wanna invite you into this time of prayer. And would you close your eyes and posture yourself before God? And let, let me guide us through this. Father, we wanna come before you and God, we wanna confront the lies with the truth of the gospel. Lord, maybe there are some who've been feeling that today like it's been about them going out to pursue you and God when it's really you coming out to pursue them. Or Lord, maybe for others, they've been feeling like, man, spiritual practices, things, these are a way to, to be good and perform for you. And, and God, rather than being invited, you're inviting them into a place of honesty with you. Yeah, with you there. And, and God, maybe there are some like me who feel like, man, you've, you've called them primarily just to use them and get stuff done. And God, that you're inviting them to rest, to know that you didn't just call them to use them, you called them to love them. And so God, we want to take some time. And first off, I just want to create space Spirit of living God, Jesus, you are on the throne. You have given us your presence. I wanna pray that you would minister to your people right now. So in this silence, God, I create some silence here and just space. I ask that you would minister and you would reveal any lie that they're believing. God, any lie from the enemy or any fear that you're under, let's just create space and listen to God. Now, if you, you have anything, if you just kind of hold that in your, your mind's eye and your thoughts before Jesus. And now, God, we bring for you, God, you are the pursuing God. You are our heavenly father who loves to minister to us as your children, to care for us, to speak truth in our lives, to guide us in your ways. And so I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would now minister to your people and that you would speak truth. What is your perspective, your truth, God, about whatever that that thing may have been, we create space to listen for your voice and ask you to administer to your people with your truth and your words to us, Lord. Jesus, you are the pursuing God. You are the God who took on flesh and bone to come after us and be reconciled to us and unite us through your cross and through your resurrection and the power of your spirit to be united in life with you forever. And so we exalt you, God. We worship you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We thank you for this reckless love, a love that looks reckless in the eyes of the watching world because, man, God, you're willing to go to such extravagant extents I get it. on one hand, it's not reckless. It's, the, it's your eternal plan, God. It's the reality behind all creation. But to us in our world, it just looks reckless. The depths that you're willing to go to be with us forever. And so we want to celebrate and lift you high and adore you, Jesus, our pursuing God, for the extravagant, outrageous love that you have shown to be united with us forever. It's in your name, Jesus, and for your glory that we pray. Amen.